the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On March 8th of this year, second Sunday of Lent, in Lent, for those of you who are accustomed to marking liturgical time, on March 8th of this year, I stood in the aisle of the church right down there and preached an impromptu sermon on Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where is my help to come. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In that sermon, those consoling words as it became clear that we were facing a time of uncertainty with regard to public health, we talked about how the people of God had been primed by a long history to trust in God. We are ready for this, I said. We are ready to trust in God even when we feel uncertain. And in fact, all of what we do as Christian people is in a sense training for the uncertainty about the future that we are feeling right now. It's on video, it's in the archive, you can look it up. Now seven months later I have something I need to tell you. When I said that, when I offered that bit of consolation, I thought it was advice that would last for two weeks, maybe three weeks, tops. I hoped that by the time Easter came and things were back to normal, we would be celebrating God's deliverance from the power of death with brass and lilies and hundreds of people packed into this room for the Feast of the Resurrection. Can you imagine? That didn't happen. That consoling word wound up needing to carry more weight than most of us thought it would. That's the way Christian consolation works sometimes. In fact, I think that's what happened to St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul writes this letter as he sits in prison awaiting trial on capital charges. He writes because he has heard that the Philippians are having trouble keeping it together. They're arguing with each other, maybe they're not even happy with themselves. He writes because he is worried that their distress over his imprisonment and over their own suffering will lead to their falling away from the faith he so passionately brought them into. And the result is what we call Philippians. But I think it's pretty unlikely that Paul intended for us to call this letter Philippians and read it regularly in church. In fact, I think it's pretty unlikely Paul thought this letter would make it to us at all. That's how Christian consolation works sometimes. Here we are, almost 2,000 years later, reading this ancient bit of consolation. Paul wrote it for his own audience in his own time, and yet those consoling words have resonated with generations of the faithful down through the ages, even to our own day, so much so that they've passed them along to us for our learning. In this part of the letter, the rhetorical flourish where Paul is bringing together the themes he's been working on for three chapters now, contains a truth that continues to console us today, the truth in which saints in every age place their hope. Keep on doing the things you have learned, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. But I want you to know that this is no platitude, No syrupy sweet drizzle to help numb or ignore the reality of the world. Modern American Christians have tended to turn this into something like, don't worry, be happy. Which has fit very well with our tendency to get comfortable, whatever the cost. But doesn't fit very well with the gospel of the cross and the empty tomb. The God of peace will be with you is not to minimize present circumstance, especially if that circumstance includes suffering. Paul is writing this letter from prison, and it seems from a close reading as though he doesn't expect to make it out. This is not someone visiting a hospital with flowers and candy and saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. Rather, this is someone saying, although life is hard, and the powers of this world are strong, 
The God of peace, the Father of Jesus, the Spirit of comfort is with you. The God of peace will be with you does not shout down cries for help when the day seems dark or cries for justice when the day seems unjust. The same Paul who made that promise also asked for the peace of God to guard the hearts and minds of the people reading his letter. Hearts and minds. That expression has an even deeper meaning on this weekend when the world marks World Mental Health Day. In this time when many of us face moments of despair, when almost all of us know the feeling of hitting the wall one day with regard to the pandemic, with loss, with political turmoil, we remember that God has blessed us with the tools to care for our spirits and our bodies and our minds. So this promise is rather the God of peace is with you and has surrounded you with people who can help care for you just as you help care for others. No, the God of peace will be with you. It's not a platitude. It's Paul's abiding belief that the love of God was made clear in Jesus Christ, who took the form of a servant and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. We believe that is the truest picture of a God who loves us enough to journey with us through anything, confident that life and love have the final word. And if that is true, it means we can trust that God's grace is always going before us and following behind us, clearing the way for us to do the good work of showing others that God's promise is trustworthy and true. It's the kind of trust that Robert Frost evokes at the end of his poem, Goodbye and Keep Cold. The poem is the internal monologue of a farmer saying goodbye to his orchard at the start of winter knowing that what happens to it for the winter is out of his hands. I wish I could promise to lie in the night and think of an orchard's arboreal plight when slowly and nobody comes with a light its heart sinks lower under the sod but something has to be left to God. That kind of peace in the face of uncertainty doesn't come overnight. It's not human nature to leave anything to God. That's why Paul starts his promise of God's peace by saying, keep on doing the things that you have learned. I think Paul is suggesting to us that Christian life in every age is a training ground, an opportunity to learn more fully how to trust in God and live like we do. Live like we trust in God. And it's much easier to learn those things together with those with whom we are connected in Christ. We affirm our faith together in worship, reminding each other of the goodness of a God who has never left us nor forsaken us. We say to each other, the Lord be with you and also with you, telling each other again and again of our trust that God's presence will be with each other, come what may. And even when we can't be in person, we offer gratitude to God together. We read Exodus and study it together. We call each other or we send cards to each other, reminding each other that the God of peace is indeed with us, working in us and through us. I said seven months ago, all of what we do together is in a sense practice for the feeling of uncertainty we may be experiencing right now. I didn't know that advice was going to be stretched over seven months so far, but I believe it was true then and I believe it is true now. In every age there have been faithful people who have waited on God's promise. I mean to say that the feeling of uncertainty we have in 2020 was there in 1941 as the Third Reich seemed unstoppable. It was there in 1918 during another global pandemic. It was there during the Black Plague, at the fall of Rome, and in hundreds of years in between. And in all of those ages, there have been people who have gathered to sing as we have sung today. Hallelujah, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And in that proclamation, they have found strength to meet the day peace to face tomorrow, 
and the deep sense that neither height nor depth nor anything in creation can separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That message is good for a day, for two or three weeks, for seven months. It's been good for generations of the people of God down through the ages who have looked to God in hope for a future better than the one we could imagine for ourselves. So saints, the only thing St. Paul and I have to promise you today is this. No matter what tomorrow may hold, keep on doing the things you have learned. And the God of peace will be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.